In this second lecture, we're going to start off by testing that we've got our movement correct on our platform by using the player to control it. So select your brain from your academy. And if you look down the script there, you'll see the action descriptions. And underneath that says action, space, type, and state, space, type. And you can set these values to continuous or discrete. Now, when you set the action space type to, to continuous, which is what we were working with before, and set the brain type to the player, it allows our player to control the platform. But first of all, you've got to program in the movement and the arrow keys for that to happen. So when you do select continuous or discrete up here, you'll see stuff change at the bottom. Let's go back to continuous. Now the size of this continuous player actions, you might think, okay, there's two, there's two actions, rotate X or rotate Z. But when it comes to the player and what actions you're going to take with respect to the keyboard is that you're going to use four different keys to do those different actions. Because you're going to have the left arrow key, the right arrow key, the up arrow key, and the down arrow key. So that means that there are in fact four different actions that we need to program in. And we can set the different keys down here in this list. So the first one we want to do is the left arrow key. So we'll look for the left arrow key, which is down here, left arrow. It's going to affect of our action array what is in index zero. The value we want it to then take on is going to be one or negative one, depending on which way you want to rotate. Okay, so I'll just put one in there for now. The next element will be the right arrow key. So we need to find the right arrow key. The element we will be affecting is going to be also the zeroth element in the action array, but we will make it a minus one. Now, next we will use the up arrow. So find up arrow and set that to one. And then we will look for the down arrow and set that to minus one. But for the down arrow, they're going to act on the second action. So its index will be one like that. Now we've immediately got an error down here because we have set up the brain up the top for all the possibilities as far as the parameters are concerned. The action size itself, okay, it's not just going to figure out what it is all by itself. And in fact, we want it to be two. So this is setting our output for our neural network. It also wants to know what our input is. So the input will be the number of states. And to remind ourselves of that, if we go back into our agent code, we'll find it in the collect state. And so here's our state array and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things that need to go through. So our input size will be eight. Now in this case, we're not worrying about memory because uh, we're playing with a player. So we've got all that set up so we can press play at this point and we'll be able to use the arrow keys to turn the platform. And when the ball falls off, it's going to reset automatically because that's when it runs our code. Now, if this isn't working for me, I've got the arrow keys around the wrong way at the moment. And so it's kind of counterintuitive the way I'm moving it. But it eventually trains me as well or not. <laughs> OK, so you get the idea. So that's now working for our player um, and you can see from setting up the player to control that that what it's doing is going back into that agent code and running through um, this here so it's doing this continuous code here and you're checking it personally as the player with the arrow keys before you let TensorFlow have a go. Because if it's not going to work for you, then TensorFlow won't be able to make any sense of it. OK, so that's the continuous state. Let's have a look how it behaves with the discrete state. To work with discrete states, you change your action space state to discrete. And that will change the values at the bottom here in the inspector. Now, we want to have four different states or 
four different actions, I should say. So we go with four. And instead of being able to set a index for anything, because there's no index in this case, we just get one value coming back from our neural network that represents one of these um, codes. So let's start off by setting the first key, which is our left arrow key is going to be a value of zero. Our right arrow key will be a value of one. Our up arrow key is going to be a value of two. And our down arrow key will be a value of, yes, you guessed it, three like that. Now, you also need to set this default action because with this, this gets sent through constantly. Um, and in fact, I'll show you what happens. So action zero is the same thing as pressing um, the left arrow key. Just before I continue, I'm going to save this because this is an experimental system and it did crash last time I tried to use discrete input. Okay, so let's play. And without touching the arrow key, you can see that it's running that zero action by default. So what you want to do here is just set that to minus one to make sure that it's not any of the options in our if statement that we put into that agent code. Now if we press play, we will find that it won't move initially, but our arrow keys are doing what we expect it to do for discrete. Now when we build this out for training, of course, we're not going to have both options available. You'll either build it as a discrete one to be trained or a continuous. I prefer the continuous because you also get that amount value built in as well. So let's go back to continuous. I just wanted to show you the difference and how you can set up both of them for the player. Now, of course, the brain type itself, when we want to do the development build for TensorFlow to create the brain, we have to set it to external down here. Now, before we make our development build, we've got all those other little settings we need to take care of. So let's go into, where is this player setting? So player, and we want to make sure that it's set to run in background and the display resolution is disabled. It's remembering this from last time. While we're in here, we'll also just check our other settings when we bring back our brain and want to run it again. And that don't forget you need to have enable underscore TensorFlow in the scripting defined symbols and it has to be set for experimental. Okay, so that's all good. It's remembered that for us. Now it's time to do our development build. So we go file, build settings, and this time we're not picking the scene from the 3D ball, we're going to do my ball. So drag and drop your scene into the scenes to build and select your project. Then make sure you've got development build selected and we will now hit build. It'll ask you where to put it. You wanna put it where you put the previous one. And so this is now called um, my, I'm going to call it purple platform, just so we don't get confused what the names are. And then we will click on save. That will build it for us. We then open up our terminal window, go into that Python folder and run Jupyter Notebook. And now we're looking to open our PPO file. But just before we do, you need to change the project that it's building with to uh, the name. So my purple platform. Okay, I've left the T out when I spelt platform, but that's okay. As long as I use exactly the same spelling in the PPO, it will be fine. Now, you might want to make a copy of your PPO file so that you can have different settings for different projects. I'm just going to use the same one again. So we'll open it up and we'll just go down to where the environment name is. And in this case, it's not Ball Training 2 anymore. It's my purple plat without a T form like that. Okay, so now we've got that. I'll leave all the other settings as they are from before. 
and we'll select the top one and then we'll just click on run and we'll go through it. Hopefully we're not going to get any errors come up. So we've loaded the environment. Now you can see that it's loaded. It's sitting up here, the little tiny one, and it's going to go into the training. So we go run and then run the training. And let me open up this window if I can. Okay, that's finished running the 50,000 that we asked it to do because that was the default from before. And you can see that the mean reward was increasing, albeit very, very slowly. But you have to remember we're using one platform and ball, whereas the Unity one had 12 platforms all training at the same time on the same brain. So it made it a little bit more efficient. The other thing is if you go and have a look inside the code that controls the balls in the Unity example, then they have a lot of restrictions on how far the platform can rotate around, whereas we've just let it do its free thing. So this will eventually, eventually it will train, um, but we will need to have a lot more iterations going on in here to get that done. But this whole idea of this particular project was to just go through all the steps to show you what bit does what. And now it's really up to you from this point with this example to see if you can train it more and to get better rewards out of it so that when you get the brain back into Unity, then uh, it will have better data. Right, at this point, what I've done is I've gone back into the settings for the ages, instead of having 50,000, I've done 500,000 steps and that seemed to get me better training results. So down here, I'll show you my training results. The reward increases and increases and increases and it gets quite good as you can see there. So that's now been saved, that particular brain. So I can bring that back into Unity. So let's just go back into Unity and I'll find that file and drag it across. So here it is, it's my purple platform without a T on it. And that brain code from TensorFlow, we need to add that to our brain. So we go back over and find our brain. We now set the type to be internal and we give it this graph file. So my purple platform, just drag and drop it on to the model. Now, before we can run this, we also need to add in one graph placeholder called Epsilon. Just select the graph placeholders and add a size of one for this. These are extra values that are being used by the neural network. Now when TensorFlow runs, it has multiple different ways in which it can run. And the one that's in that default PPO file actually has this Epsilon value in it. And Epsilon is related to the exploration methods that we've talked about in the past about getting random chances and that and a value that also decays over time and if it's used in the call which you can check by looking in the code uh, that's in that python code you'll see that there's an epsilon value set in there and if it is unity wants to know about it down here before it will run it's also a floating point in this case you don't need to set the min and max values it will still work without them Right, so with that finally set, um, let's press play and see how well we trained our ball. Well, not the ball, we've trained the platform. And it's, it's trained very well. It's nice and steady and the ball is staying on the platform. Now, we can also test this by moving the ball. If we just grab hold of the ball, maybe lift it up and see if our platform will still... Yep, it's done done very well to keep it there that's great so we didn't program any hit the space bar move the ball type code in here to a different position which we could um, but I've just moved it by hand and you can see that okay so that's that's excellent so we've now built our own from scratch ML agent we've trained it up and we've put the brain back in here so have fun playing around with that code. There's so many different possibilities that you can now do with the power of TensorFlow and knowing all of those things you know about neural networks. Thanks for watching. 
Please support the development of more superb online learning content by subscribing. And as always, visit holistic3d.com to learn more about awesome games development books and tutorials.